Uh, my name is Tadas, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, how to integrate uh, Python with Rust and uh, how we used that integration for speeding up uh, Python. So, uh, my plan today is uh, at first it's introductions, and then it will be a short, uh, I'll talk a bit, a bit about Rust. Uh, then I'll talk uh, what options are there for integrating Python and Rust. Then we'll move to the code demo. So I'll show you the code where I write the uh, Rust code, which we can call from Python. And uh, I, then I will talk about our case study where we used uh, in the, our company and of course the conclusion. So uh, to start uh, a bit about myself, I have started my career eight or some or nine years ago as a as an IT support specialist. Then I moved to uh, to work as a systems administrator. After that, I moved to work as a software engineer, where my main uh, programming languages were Python and Rust. So I worked on uh, IPTV project and data collection from IoT devices. After that, I moved uh, to Oxilabs, where I'm currently working. At first, I worked as a software developer uh, with, uh, uh, as, a, as a software develop, developer. Uh, yeah. And uh, half a year ago or so, I became a tech lead of one of uh, Oxlabs companies, uh, teams, sorry. So, uh, a bit about Oxlabs. Uh, Oxlabs is a is the company which uh, provide, provides proxies, which does the scraping as a service. We do data collection and aggregation, and we do some other stuff, but we won't uh, get into that today. So uh, a high level overview, what is a Rust as a programming language? So it's, it is a systems programming language, which is statically and strongly typed. And the main feature, that uh, makes Rust unique is uh, its memory safety story. So its memory safety story is achieved with borrow checker. So as you can imagine, there are a couple of ways where how you manage me memory, uh, where in C you allocate and uh, free memory uh, manually, at least in the C I know. And uh, in Python, Java, or languages like that, there is a garbage collector, which uh, collects uh, unused memory. So in Rust, uh, Rust has a borrow checker, uh, and it means that uh, you don't have to manually manage memory. It uh, frees memory when the memory goes out of scope, but it does not use garbage collector. So it means that it doesn't have runtime and can, as a language, can be used for low-level programming. So uh, the Rust community has the the saying that the Rust trifecta that Rust uh, strives to achieve uh, three goals: it's speed, safety, and concurrency, and easy concurrency. So moving from that, uh, let's talk about the, a bit about speed. So I took data from uh, Benchmarks game, so where people implement uh, specific uh, specific solutions to a problem with different programming languages. Uh, in this case, uh, it's an implementation for Mandelbrot uh, set. It paints a fractal, and you can see that uh, fastest languages in uh, in that category are uh, C++ and Rust. And uh, you can see I added and uh, 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 I added Python three as an example to to see the difference between the uh, speed. But of course, uh, nobody uses Python for speed. So talking about memory safety, so uh, talking about memory safety, uh, I have a couple examples uh, of uh, how Rust manages it. So let's say we have uh, uh, a function, the main function, we create a vector. Uh, vector as in a, would be a list in Python. So it's just a simple list and we, uh, assign it to a variable. So now the variable back uh, is an owner of that memory space, space which houses that uh, vector. And uh, every memory space can have uh, one owner. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, one owner. And when I pass uh, uh, that value, that vector to a function, uh, that function takes ownership of that vector of that memory. And uh, let's say here, it's uh, just a simple code, which does nothing, but just an, as, a, as an example. And when the, that, that uh, variable, that owner goes out of scope, uh, Rust compiler automatically adds uh, drop functions to free that memory. So in this case, let's say, so in this case, we have vector, we have a function which takes that vector and takes the ownership of the vector. And you can see, I tried to use here uh, to print that uh, vector after taking ownership and the compiler would give me an error and I wouldn't be able to. So the main thing here to note is that the compiler is quite strict and uh, the compiler thinks about uh, the memory management uh, a lot and you don't have to do that manually. Of course, it would be quite limiting to have, uh, an, uh, to, don't have to not have an ability to pass uh, the references to functions and so on. In Rust, it's called, uh, it's called borrowing. So you can see here, the difference here is the, in the type and in the passing argument, the ampersand. So we, when we pass with an ampersand, it means that uh, that function, the scope, it borrows that, uh, that value. It doesn't take ownership. It just uh, has, uh, has that uh, value borrowed for, uh, for some time. So then we can do the, the same thing, assign a simple vector to, to a variable pass that variable to multiple functions. And uh, I, when, when I try to print that vector, everything runs, co runs correctly and works. Yeah, so next thing is uh, uh, Rust core programmers, what, uh, what we are trying to achieve. Uh, the, the thing is that we're trying to achieve the fearless concurrency where you don't have uh, data races, you don't have deadlocks and uh, problems like that, and uh, they are checked and uh, enforced by the compiler. Uh, so we can see as an, as an example here, I'm trying to create uh, another vector. It's a, just another list, which I assigned to vect. You can see the difference here that I added the keyword mut. So that keyword means that the value is mutable. By default, that value is not, by default, all variables in Rust are not mutable. So we need to add the, add the mute keyword to make the, uh, the variable mutable. And uh, I spawn a thread and I try to add another value to, to the thread. And you can see the compiler prints a lot of, a lot of stuff. If you work a bit with Rust, you will, uh, you will easily know what everything means. And it basically says that uh, this uh, thread, the closure of the thread, does not own back variable, and uh, it cannot add the uh, uh, add uh, it cannot modify it. Uh, if I would have here a vector without a mutable uh, keyword, I could print uh, everything in uh, in thread. I could use that variable because it's immutable. So I could use that uh, in multiple threads, but I can't uh, mutate it uh, from a thread without uh, some other stuff. So another example here is that uh, if I add a keyword move here, that means that uh, move all the ownership uh, to the closure of the thread, uh, all the ownerships for variables which are used in that, uh, in that closure. So here, we would move that, uh, that vector uh, ownership to the thread and we could add uh, the variable. So we could add another value here, but uh, you can see that uh, I tried to print it after, the, after spawning the thread. And now it complains that uh, the value was moved into the, into the closure and uh, I can't use it after the move. So there are primitives in the uh, Rust uh, standard library for solving these things. It's uh, called uh, atomic reference counting so at the, and mutexes. So you can use mutexes, atomic reference counters, or message passing between threads for achieving uh, 
achieving uh, data race free uh, concurrency and using and mutating data from multiple threads. So talking about uh, Rust and Python, so how do you integrate uh, those two? I won't go into very deep detail. I'll show you a code, how everything looks, but uh, I use uh, Py03 library for Rust, which is uh, uh, Rust bindings for Python. And uh, I use uh, Maturin tool for build integration. Of course, there are other ways of integrating uh, Rust and uh, Python. One of the ways would be using another library, Rust C Python, or you could just write because uh, Rust was made as a system programming language, it has uh, good uh, interoperability with C. So you can write uh, you can write Rust code, which uh, you can export as a C API, and you could use that C API uh, with, from Python. But uh, it doesn't have, uh, it's not that beautiful as using uh, libraries uh, which, I made, which were made for that. So let's uh, move to the code. Sorry. Yeah. So you can see this. So let's start just from, uh, uh, from the project file, project toml. So you can see here, I have a simple package, which has uh, a definition uh, and uh, some dependencies. I have a, uh, a mature independence for, for building that. But the main thing is the build system uh, and build backend. So here, when uh, I put uh, the mature into build backend, I can use pip to install this package. So pip automatically, because pip supports the project toml and different build backends, it can automatically uh, call mature and uh, compile the code. Of course, you need Rust compiler, unless you're using Python wheels and uh, you can compile that code. So as for, this is from the P project toml. Uh, Rust has uh, its own package manager uh, and it's called Cargo. And we need to create uh, a Cargo, Cargo toml where we define how our, our Rust package looks. So everything, Almost everything here is standard when you do just a cargo new project and, and that's it. The main thing is that we're using not binary project, but library as a project. This is the library name and it's a create type. It's a, we need this. So let's, let's call it a bit of a magic value. I won't go to the very much detail here. And we use the, and we declare pi of three as a dependency for this project. So moving to the code, uh, let's say, uh, I'll show you a bit. So how do we implement a, a simple function which we could call from, from Python? So uh, here I'm implementing a simple, simple function which is named uh, very originally simple function. Uh, and this function does uh, just one thing, it returns a vector. I seem to really like vectors here. Uh, and uh, the main thing here is that we need to use uh, PyO3 annotations. And these annotations are used by procedural macros of Rust, which adds uh, add an, another layer of code uh, on comp in compile time, which uh, exports that function as a C API, wraps in a C API, which you could then use uh, uh, from Rust. So we can, we can, show that I'm not lying and we can use it. So uh, when using uh, Maturin develop, we, it means that uh, it compiles the package and it installs in the current virtual environment or current Python, current Python, uh, current Python environment. So let's wait a bit while it compiles. So Python, so from Rusty Python, import simple function. And I can call that simple function, oh, sorry. 
simple function it, and it returns. So, and here the PI03 does the implicit uh, type conversion from uh, Rust types to uh, Python types. Of course, you could use, uh, uh, you could use, uh, there are implementations like PI list and so on. So you could use uh, Python types directly, but it's uh, easier, a bit easier to pay the price of type conversion between Python types and Rust types because you get the strict typing of the uh, of Rust language. And so this is a simple function and uh, I, I'm sorry I didn't write, uh, didn't show you at first, but uh, this is how you define the uh, Py module. This is my module module which is called the uh, uh, rusty python and uh, i add a function to that module and you can add of course uh, uh, a number of uh, functions you can add classes you can have sub modules and so on so uh, moving on uh, we have a simple function which we call, we can call from uh, rust uh, sorry from python uh, let's do a python class uh in rust so in rust the data and the implementation details are separated so you define the structure with uh, uh with let's say the state which you will hold and with the data which the class will hold so here we define the, the struct which is called test class and it will be named uh, test class in python uh, as a class and here we have uh, another annotation, is annotation, which is uh, called Py class. And here we do the implementations for the methods. Uh, impl, impl test class is a uh, rest specific, so and we we need to add the annotation for Py methods. So the first function is just a is just in initialization function. You can see I add another annotation that this function is new, uh, should be uh, exported as new for Python. And I can uh, add uh, a number of arguments for that function. Here I, am, I just added uh, another annotation to show that it's possible to add, uh, it's possible to add the optional parameters and so on. And uh, based on this optional parameter, I, I just do like, if the optional parameter is bigger, I create a, a list with four elements. If the optional parameter is none or anything else, or default, uh, I create a parameter with uh, three uh, with three items in the list. Uh, one specific to note that uh, Rust doesn't have exceptions like Python does. So Rust the function and uh, function types, return types, they have, uh, they have uh, if the function is fallible, the function has to return uh, result type. Uh, so if I wouldn't be using in Python here, it would, uh, in, in, in Rust, it would be a result and we can return either okay value or error value in that. So it's easy to bubble up uh, errors through layers uh through layers and it's easy to know even from the type which functions are fallible and which fun functions are infallible so here i created a few other classes like it's just a simple get vector which just returns that that vector for python uh, as you imagine there is a there is a separation layer a boundary the foreign function interface layer between uh, python and rust and uh, we need to, we can't pass Python the memory directly. It, it wouldn't work. So we need to clone that value and pass it to, to, to Python. So I can show you how it works. Uh, so just simple. So we created that class. So let's say we get that vector. We get, and at the same time, we can add, the, add those uh, optional arguments. So we get, uh, we get everything. So uh, 
I wanted to show you how to, to use uh, the exceptions for Python. So I created very stupidly named the uh, uh, function, which which name is not logical and its function is not log logical, but uh, let's ignore that. The function is uh, get that if contains. So uh, the function returns vector if it contains past value. If it doesn't, it uh, returns p value error. So you can see the Rust uh, semantics for returning uh, returning a good result and bad result here. And as you can see, uh, Pio3 has implemented uh, has implementations for those uh, bindings, so you can cre create the value error exception uh, for Python from Rust. So we, let's say we get one and uh, because the vector contains one it returns it but let's say if we do nine we get we get a value error so and uh, of course we we have uh, it's a simple examples but uh, i can show you that uh, uh, we even can sorry we even can do things like setters and getters. Uh, I, I have not shown it here, but you can do, you can implement uh, Python magic objects for classes in Rust and uh, so on. Magic, sorry, magic methods. So here I, for this uh, vector, instead of, uh, instead of having get vec function, I add a notation which says that uh, implement uh, getters and setters for these values for this uh, value. So, okay. Let's import it again, create a test class. And now we have a property back, which is implemented here. And we even can assign it a value. And let's say I assign it not a list. So it checks and I get a, a type error and I can assign it to list. And it works. So this is basically how the integration looks. It uh, may look a bit uh, like magic, like there are magic methods, like those annotations and so on. But if you work a bit with Rust, uh, it, it, it's come, it comes quite naturally after that. So, okay, getting back to my presentation. So I showed you the code, how we programs, uh, how we integrate it, how the code looks. So I'll talk about a bit uh, the project where we use this integration. So we had a problem, but we, we have a database. Here it's MySQL database, and it has a lot of data. It's over, it's terabytes of data. And we need to take that data and uh, to mangle it and ser serialize it into a specific JSON object. And that data comes from uh, multiple tables and so on into one single JSON object. So we, what we wrote is uh, we wrote a serialization for those objects to, uh, to JSON with Rust using uh, Serda serialization deserialization library for us and diesel as an ORM for us. After that, uh, after the serialization, uh, the serializer uh, passes uh, those values to workers and workers, uh, they do, they write those uh, serialized values to multiple storages. And uh, why did we do that? Uh, at first, we wanted an explicit definition, like uh, we wanted to define explicitly how the models look, what we take, and uh, what is the end result. So at first, we tried uh, implementing the serialization with uh, Pydantic. It's an interesting library for Python, uh, which, can, uh, which can serialize it to Python, the direct the SQL Alchemy ORM models. So, but the performance was uh, not quite good. Let's say we have uh, hundreds of millions of objects, and one object will take uh, 0.3 seconds. So after that, we, it was not enough, and it was bottlenecking. Uh, it was our bottleneck in that case. Our database well, could support more. We could uh, 
we could uh, write to the storages more, but the serialization was uh, bottlenecking us. So we tried the, the SQL Alchemy ORM model serialization with Marshmallow. It went from uh, not very good to worse, and uh, one object uh, uh, serialization would take uh, around 1.5 and 2 seconds. Uh, one, uh, so it was a, a big downgrade. So the fastest, uh, the fastest uh, way for serializing that my colleague implemented was just uh, writing pure SQL uh, functions, mashing everything into dictionary, uh, and uh, then using JSON dump. And uh, it was good for uh, for single. Uh, it was good for single object uh, serialization, uh, but uh, so. Thousand objects would take, I think, uh, 30 or 40 seconds to serialize, which was quite good. But uh, with this method, we lost a lot of uh, a lot of uh, explicitness. Explicitness. So we would have uh, some SQL functions and so on, and uh, uh, it looked like a, a bit like not a mess, but uh, it was not as good as it could be. So we. Then we implemented everything in Rust, and uh, our time for serializing thousand objects went from 30, 40 seconds to eight seconds. And this is uh, of single-threaded Rust code. When we added, because the the serialization of objects is uh, quite a parallel parallelizable problem, when we added parallelization, the time went from eight seconds to two seconds on four-core machine. So uh, this is uh, my conclusion that <laughs> Rust is very cool. Uh, it is very easy to integrate Rust and Python. The, as, uh, as, you could, as you saw, it's quite easy. And the plus is that you can surgically replace parts of Python with Rust for various games. And what I mean for various games, so you can, uh, this could be performance, this could be uh, skipping the global interpreter lock because uh, Rust uh, code runs in other contexts. So uh, you can use threads, threads there and it won't, be, uh, it won't be impacted by global interpreter lock. So, okay, uh, this is uh, everything I have. So of course, as uh, Oxlabs as a company is hiring. So if you want, uh, you could write us at career at oxlabs.io. If you have any questions about working at Oxlabs and so on, you can uh, write me, you can find me on LinkedIn and write me. And uh, thanks for your attention.